Hello, I am so excited for this episode of Pocket Six Unscripted. I am here with Lauren Rosario Maldonado. And you say so well. <laughs> Thank you. I realized I should have asked you how to pronounce it before. Um, so I'm glad it came out right because names are important. And it is always yes. important to me to pronounce people's names right and learn how to do that. Um, I, I just, it's staggering to me how many people don't care about that. And I just like a name is so important. I've had, you know, kids that I've worked with who are like, Oh, my teacher gave me a new name. Cause again, that's unacceptable. That's like that part unacceptable. of identity. Um, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So all the intersections and dimensions of our identity. And I'm super excited to share this conversation with you. So welcome. Here we are. Lauren, tell me a little bit about um, the work you do in the world. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And again, thank you so much for your grace and, and the opportunity to speak about this here. My journey uh, started, at least into this space, started when I was working on my master's, uh, focusing around organizational, uh, industrial and organizational psychology with a focus on uh, cultural psychology. Mm -hmm. And to, in my master's studies, I, I was able to explore the, the cultural nuances the global cultural nuances in a much deeper way, deeper than I ever had. You know, when I went to, early on in my academic career, I studied uh, child psychology and human services. Mm -hmm. So I've been on this sort of uh, service, a uh, service oriented career uh, journey for quite some time. But my, my call to action or the catalyst that really, uh, nudged me or propelled me forward into the cultural psychology space was in the course of my master's studies. I was a global leader, a global HR leader for this organization. And we had a presence uh, in over 18 countries, uh, you know, Latin America, Europe, North America. And so I was able to experience firsthand what I was learning in school at the time. But the reason why it made such an impact on me was because up until that point, I realized I was culturally agnostic. I had no clear understanding about my heritage and where my cultural values um, came from and what they meant. I didn't even know what they were. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know the word cultural values. So that, that's mm -hmm. the extent to my, to my naivete at the time. I love that. And cultural agnostic. I've not heard that before. And that's just such a rich term. I just wanted to, <laughs> to throw that in there. I came to that conclusion because in this particular course, we were learning uh, how to counsel in diverse communities. Mm -hmm. So very parallel to my day job in HR. And it was in that course where I understood not only, uh, not only how how cultures are different across the globe and how they shape us as individuals, but how much they intersect with the different dimensions of our identity. That was the biggest aha for me. And in that in that experience, I I went through you know, something like an identity crisis and an existential crisis because I had to really strip myself of every belief I held up until that point mm -hmm. and really connect with who I am as a person and, and figure out who that even was. And this work helped me understand that our identity not only is a multidimensional, but that the different aspects that we ascribe to each of those dimensions and the different, the value that we ascribe mm -hmm. is very different. We were talking about names. For someone, mm -hmm. their name is number one priority in that dimension. 
mix. Mm. Whereas others, it may be their race because of their skin color or their neurodivergence because of their, their neurodiversity. So understanding this helped me understand and, and connect deeper with who I am as a person and really forced me to look in the mirror. It really did. I had to confront myself head on and recognize that I did myself have many biases because I was culturally agnostic and completely dis disconnected in that sense. And in my work, I discovered cultural intelligence and it completely changed my life. I don't think people can ever comprehend as many times as I write about it, how much it changed my life because it helped me appreciate not only the differences that exist amongst ourselves, but appreciate the differences within myself mm. and how I can coexist with others who are different and yet still preserve my authenticity and honor theirs. Um, that's huge work. <laughs> and it's hard, right? It's super vulnerable to look at those parts of us and come into deeper awareness and understanding of who we are. Um, I've shared about this, like, so I'm a late realized autistic adhd -er. I'm also a late bloomer queer, late bloomer gender expansive. And, you know, sometimes there's a question of like, how could you not know these things about yourself? And I think just like, just like you said, there's all these unconscious biases the way that we are raised and the things that we're taught also can block us from knowing parts of ourselves. And it is, it is a lifelong work, I think, to be knowing ourselves. And, you know, I think as a retired trauma therapist, I'm definitely a huge fan of the work that we do to have a relationship and a healed and healthy relationship with ourselves. Um, because that's the, that's the core relationship that gets harmed by any trauma. Absolutely. There. Absolutely. Um, and to your point, you know, I was sort of a, a late boomer in the sense that I, I learned that I have and have had ABD my entire life, but it wasn't diagnosed till I was in my forties. I'm going to yeah. be 50. So understanding that learning that I learn differently mm -hmm. put so many things in perspective yes it was a humbling experience but at the same time it helped me connect with with my own needs mm -hmm. in a way that was authentic to me unapologetically I love that yeah I I'm 44 and um, kind of fully came into recognition of uh, my autistic ADHD at 42. So that's a lot of life, as you know, <laughs> to live without knowing these pieces of ourselves and, and also receiving the messaging from the world around us about why we're not hitting that mark that we're supposed mm -hmm. to be hitting um, in in performing, whether that was in school or in society or in the workplace, um, there is <laughs> there is kind of like this whole new set of work once we come into this part of our identity in deconstructing all the harmful messaging that that has been imposed on us that we've carried with us um, around all this time. So yeah, I mean, I just. I, I'm resonating with so much of, of what you're talking about. Yeah, because, you know, th those messages, the, that mental programming, right, um, exists at some level subconsciously. This is what we've heard. This is what we've seen all of, all of our lives, right? I, I remember in school, uh, in grade school, I was a C student, CD. 
student, never interested because I could never really kind of calm down my brain. Um, you know, teachers were always complaining about uh, how inattentive I was, how inattentive I was, you know, I was always day daydreaming. The, later I found out what, why that was. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got my first A in college and I remember thinking, wow, my teachers were wrong. I, I can actually get an A. Oh, okay, let me try this again. And so little by little, I learned to kind of program myself differently. But I still felt in the back of my mind that I was, you know, not a good student because I was inattentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have held an identity of I'm not, I'm not really smart. And um, like up until in the recent last two years, have I learned, like, I don't learn the way that neurotypicals learn, but that doesn't mean that I'm not smart. <laughs> I like, if I was afforded opportunities to learn in different ways that work with my brain, I'm, I might've had a different sense of myself. Um, and despite, I mean, my grades were all over the place, like math and sciences were C's and D's, English and, and history were higher grades, but it was hard. Everything about school was hard, except for like fire practice. I love that. It was like one break for my brain. Um, but yeah, I, I had this impression about myself that because it was so hard and it was such a struggle, that must mean I'm not smart. And, mm -hmm. and that way of viewing myself was not remedied until in my 40s, which is, yeah, I mean, it's just staggering sometimes as we think about these things. You mentioned too about kind of how coming into this part of your identity and 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 understanding all these intersecting parts really allowed you to, to honor your own boundaries um, better, to, to be able to know what your needs are and, and express them. And yeah, I would love to hear more about that process for you in terms of what was it like to be, you know, maybe communicating different boundaries to people around you or restructuring your life to accommodate you? I will be very honest with you. I love that word, establishing boundaries, because, or those words, because I'm, I was so afraid. I was very happy to learn that there, there is something different about mm -hmm. my cognitive ability. Because for me personally, a lot of things made sense. But I was so afraid afraid to tell anybody. Um, I think I kind of mentioned it to my husband and it really took me a long time to, to really talk about it. Mm. Uh, I, you know, again, society positions us to behave a certain way. You hold a certain title, you have to behave in a certain way in order to, to sustain that title. You know, I was the head of HR for this global organization. And so I have to have it all put together and I have to be ultra perfect and, you know, completely on all the time. So it took me, I want to say it took me a few years to really gain the courage to talk about it. And honestly, thinking back, that courage came as a res uh, around the time that I started doing this work when I started learning about uh, cultural intelligence and mm -hmm. really truly inclusive counseling because that was the focus mm -hmm. of, of the work at the time. And it was then when I when I saw how my biases were preventing me from helping others feel seen. Mm -hmm. I then summoned the courage to take a step back and see myself first, if that makes any sense. Because I learned that, you know, I've, I've been through all types of technical development uh, programs, right? I'm a coach, I've been through school, I'm working on my PhD, and, and those are great. 
But if you don't meet yourself where you are, you can never meet someone where they are. And I, it was for the first time I asked myself, are you seeing yourself? Mm -hmm. And I get chills because I think back to that moment and that's really when I started taking myself seriously. Above and beyond the work, I started accepting myself. And then once I, I started accepting myself, and this was a very internal process for, for some time. Mm -hmm. But once I, I grew comfortable in this new space of self-acceptance and, and awareness, then I started talking to others little by little you know i started with my husband and i started with my my daughter and it wasn't it wasn't full-on conversations in the beginning it was sound bites yeah but it was it was a very empowering experience for me because i chose to see myself first before anyone else and i think everything else kind of fell into place. And I say that very loosely, but it did fall into place mm -hmm. after that. What a powerful statement. I chose to see myself and to be like known and seen by myself. I think about part of my journey in life. I have struggled with the challenge of kind of unconditional self-compassion and I found that after coming into awareness of my autistic ADHD, it was like a switch flip. And I was suddenly able to be so much more kind and compassionate to myself because I had this new information. I was no longer working with the narrative of, you know, you're lazy, you're just not trying hard enough, you're not committed, blah, blah, blah. I was working with a new narrative of, I'm not a failed human. I'm just not at a good neurotypical because I'm not neurotypical, but it's not a failing, not a failed human. I am my own person in this other category. And I've been measured by others and trying to measure myself up to a measuring stick that doesn't, is not compatible with me. And, and I was so shocked that it was like almost so easy to be kind toward myself then because I, you know, it was, I think about what you said, just like the actually seeing myself and, you know, being open to like, oh, I don't have to beat myself up for the thing that I need being, you know, mad at myself that I need it. I can honor that as this is a way to accommodate myself and to work with my brain and my body versus working against it. Like, Ugh, come on, like, why, why am I so sensitive to these sensory things? Like, come on, just suck it up and do the thing, right? Like, that's the messaging that I've heard from outside and stopping to say like, no, this, this, I, I don't have to be miserable in a t-shirt no. that feels gross. I am allowed to take it off and donate it, take it out of my rotation. I don't have to suffer through those things. And I, I hear from a lot of folks who are like, yes, it's like it, this coming into this identity gave me permission to begin meeting my own needs in ways that I didn't feel like I was allowed to before. Yeah. And it, I almost, you know, throughout these past few years, because it's been now five years since that time, I want to say I've, I've grown more confident in my boundaries than I have ever in my life. I don't know if that has to do with almost turning 50. Maybe that's a little bit to do with it. But I, with practice and consistency and intention, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm learning to grow more comfortable in that space. And as I grow more comfortable, I help others grow more comfortable, mm -hmm. which is why I love the work that I do because my coaching is centered around this. You know, the work that I do at Cultura is centered around this, not necessarily to change people, 
because you, that's not the intention here, but to really expand perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Expand, stretch that muscle and allow yourself to be in that expansion. And it's in that expansion where, where transformation takes place. It's a very big word, but when you see the person, aha, uh -huh, and that shift in that moment, it's, it's priceless. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think about what you've said too, about, you know, we, we ourselves are this embodiment of multidimensional identity. I remember <laughs> writing like with a written interview that I was doing with someone and they're like, how do you describe yourself? And I was like, I don't know. I'm like a four dimensional tesseract, just kind of like existing <laughs> among different planes, like kind of how I feel. And, <laughs> and I know a lot of neurodivergent folks who like identify with like this, I'm some kind of concept just outside of understanding, not really quite human. Um, Cause I think we have such a, an acute awareness of some of these aspects of identity that maybe other people gloss over, or we have done such meticulous introspection to, I mean, I think for many of us, it was the result of like being bullied or discriminated against and like, oh, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Let me scour my whole being to find the flaws, right? Like, but in that process, we've gotten to know ourselves really well you know, side effect of like a negative thing. I'm also curious about, you know, I think one of the things that I continue to learn about, especially for folks who are late, late realized, right? The, the population of folks who have been overlooked are like kind of every other area of history where folks have been excluded and overlooked. Women, Black, Indigenous women, gender expansive folks who are socialized as women. Um, Low socioeconomic status populations. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, I, I just before we got on this, this um, video, I was reading um, something that a friend of mine wrote about just like how Black voices have been left out of autism research and autism conversation. Um, and so I would love to hear from you about, I don't know, your, your experience kind of culturally as you're coming into your neurodivergence and things that you want people to know and understand about, you know, like I, I see neurodiversity as spanning every other identity, right? Of sexuality, race, ability. Um, but that's, that doesn't often get nuanced in the conversation around like, what does black autistic look like? What does indigenous autistic look like? Or, you know, uh, fill in the blank with whatever neurodivergence you identify with. And I think that that is such a, uh, I'm gonna call it this, that that phenomenon is such a travesty because mm -hmm. your identity, my identity, everyone's, everyone, identity is multidimensional. And I feel like we always tend to want to label something, lead with something. So kind of putting people in this little box and then lead with that, you know? Oh, so you are an African American who is neurodivergent. Oh, you are a, or you are a, but this is, this is one aspect of the person's identity. Mm -hmm. And doing that really, doing that really loses sight of all the other aspects that complete the person, which form part of a person's identity. And that's what prevents us from helping them feel seen. Mm. You know, someone who's, who's on the extreme end of the spectrum, right? Maybe level three, four, 
may lead with that as part of their identity because it is what, what is the most impactful aspect of the lived experience. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that as I am addressing this person, that that is what I should address them as. Mm -hmm. Because then I am preventing that person from feeling supported, seen, and heard. Right. And that's the hard part. We're so conditioned to think in terms of labels. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was telling someone the other day that, you know, I was happy when my daughter was no longer in grade school because I finally had a name. I was no longer, oh, you know, Sarah's mom. <laughs> right. Oh, here's Sarah's mom. Here, Yes, that's a part of my identity, but it's not my number one. It's not the only thing that I'm about. Mm -hmm. And and the true, you know, the same holds true for this yeah. scenario. I feel like we are so much more than X, Y, Z. Yes. And that's the the aspect that really comes as a result of understanding. I feel like the the more time we spend understanding these intersections and how they impact and they influence a person's lived experience, then the more perspective we will have to then coexist and connect. And that's yeah. how I see the, you know, the, the interaction kind of like a math problem, right? You understand mm -hmm. to then seek to, the, to include that person and, interact so that you can connect mm. yeah I love that and I I think about so at the core it this is the practice of us humanizing each other right because when when you know I think about ways that newspaper articles are written that dehumanize a person and just label them with race or ability or gender, right? And, um, you know, something, a conversation that comes up a lot in the disability justice world and community is, is around, you know, how, how can we be seen as full human? There are disabilities that we deal with, yes, and also we're sexual beings, we have a gender, we have dreams and passions. We have like all of the human parts of us together. And, and I think that's part of, um, you know, when I think about neurodivergence, I think one of our strengths is being able to hold like multitudes and sometimes even paradoxical multitudes at once and be like, yeah, that, this is all existing simultaneously. And maybe it looks like a tangled mess and I don't have to sort it out. I just honor that this is all existing simultaneously. Whereas I think some other brains struggle with the concept of multiple things are happening at once. We Absolutely. might put forward, like you said, we might put forward a certain identity. Some people might put forward a certain thing, a certain feeling of like, oh, I'm frustrated. They may also be feeling kind of, additional feelings simultaneously but frustrated is the one that comes out right and even and even you know I always highlight and and um, emphasize that it's so important not to generalize mm -hmm. because even even amongst the the neurodivergent population for example you have intersections there too mm -hmm. you have different dimensions there too that intersect with other aspects other dimensions of diversity. So it's it's this, I see it as this kaleidoscope where mm -hmm. no two kaleidoscopes are the same, but yet they come together and they form this beautiful image, right? Mm -hmm. And so the same is true here. It's, we can't generalize, which is, which is why we need to listen and understand so that we can expand our perspective, right? and then help the person, whoever it is we're talking to feel seen. Yes, I love that. I was sharing with somebody yesterday, my, my personal version of utopia is, <laughs> it's quite simple in idea that we all replace 
making assumptions with being curious. And that's what I'm hearing in what you're saying is the assumption that so many of us are trained, myself included. These are things I've had to be unlearning and deconstructing. Um, the assumptions make generalizations. And if we can come to each new person that we encounter, each new scenario with like led by curiosity, it, I think it will transform so, so much of our spaces in terms of, let me be curious about, you know, what's going on with this person that they made that face or use that tone of voice or didn't want to sit with me at lunch. Let me be curious about it. Um, yeah. So like I said, it's kind of a, a simple notion, but I think, wow, what, what could really happen if we pursued like relentless curiosity as a culture, you know, as a like humanity? Absolutely. And it's so great that you mentioned curiosity because it is one of the, you know, one of the cornerstones of CQ. You know, it's the cultural intelligence drive is is that it's it's your your incessant, relentless drive to stay curious. It's intentional. It's a choice, but it's through that curiosity that you can then expand your perspective to understand. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think like I need my business expansive expressions because of that exactly. exact experience. I was like, this just keeps getting bigger. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's, you know, as, as we evolve and as we have, you know, generation after generation evolve with, in and of itself, this expansion is going to increase more and more. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I love all of it. This has been such an inspiring and engaging conversation. Um, we're going to wrap up in just a moment or two, but I would love for you to share, are there any projects that you're working on that you would love for people to know about or um, ways that people can work with you, read things that you've written? Absolutely. So my, the biggest project I am working on is my book, I'm literally in the middle of revisions. It should publish uh, this fall, around November. Exciting. And I'm so excited because in this book, I, I write a lot about the power of cultural intelligence and in not just my own story, but I share stories of others who have discovered the power of, of cultural intelligence and how they've navigated a lot of these complexities. Um, you can hear more about my work on my website, cultura.global, uh, C-U-L-R-T-U-R-A, uh, .global, G-L-O-B-A-L. Um, or you can read more about my book in www.laurenrosario.com, L-O-R-E-N-R-O-S-A-R-I-O. And I love to post all these tidbits on LinkedIn. So don't hesitate to follow me there. Wonderful. I will be sure to put all, capture all of those links that you have mentioned and have them in the show notes so folks can click on them and connect. And I don't know, I feel like maybe we should have another conversation when your book comes out. We should. To celebrate. And I would love to. to you, you know, promote it. I would it. love to. And yeah. I'll send you a copy and you let me know what you think. I would love that. Thank you so much for sharing time and space with us today. I just am so grateful that you exist in the world and are doing the things that you are doing. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I so appreciate what you're doing. I, I love that we are creating these spaces for people to come together and understand, mm. particularly in the neurodivergent space. Yes, I love it. All right, folks, we'll stay tuned for the next episode and we'll see you then.